11 is today's number. Eleven. 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 Am I ready? I think so. Mike or Eleven? The subject of calculus has three dimensions. First, we learn derivatives. Then, we reverse the process for integration. And finally, we proved the existence of both with limits. But what if I told you Calc 2 has a fourth dimension? In chapters 11 and 12, we branch out into the world of series, the study of infinite patterns. Six examples, five top 12 mathematicians, a fourth field of calculus, three dimensions shattered, two much fun in one lesson. I give you 11-2. All right, BC students, we've mastered 11-1, which was just kind of the basic introduction to series. Now we really start to step up our game and we investigate 11-2. All right, let's start off with an easy warm-up question, but it's kind of a trick question too. Statement, if x equals 3, then x squared equals 9, true or false? If x equals 3, then x squared equals 9. Yeah, of course that's true, right? True. All right, these are called if-then statements. You study these in college also. The converse, we've mentioned this before, the converse is when you switch a statement in English, right? So if you switch it backwards, it would be if x squared equals 9, comma, then x must equal 3, right? So I'm thinking of a number. I've got a number in my head. All right, I've got it. I'm going to give you a clue. When I square the number I'm thinking of in my head, I get 9. Must it be x equals 3? A lot of even good math students would say, yeah, that's true. False. What if I was thinking negative 3? Negative 3 squared makes positive 9, but it was not 3. All you need is one counterexample, and you can prove something false forever because true means it works for every single case all right that just failed x could equal three it also could equal negative three so to state that it must be three no if you had said x equals plus or minus three then it would have been true so that is a false statement and then there's something that i think i mentioned before in calculus but i want to bring it up again in case i didn't or in case it's been too long in math when you have a statement that is true, it, the converse is very rarely true in mathematics, okay? In real life, that's kind of 50-50 in English, but in mathematics, rarely can you switch a statement around and it still be true, but there are a few of those called if and only if statements in math, but, but not many, okay? So I'm gonna see one today where when you look at it, you know it's true, but when you switch it around backwards, a lot of students think maybe it could still be true, but it's not, beware of the converse. All right, so let's start with this. Mr. Wade, don't we always start with letter A? Why are we starting with E? Oh, this is E from a previous sheet. We'll call it previous E, all right? So, sounds, sounds like a rapper, previous E, all right? Now, previous E, we did the 1 fourth to the N minus 1. We did this uh, summation, this series. Oh, this was the Archimedes triangle, remember? Where you do like 1 fourth and 1 fourth and 1 fourth, and you get little tiny triangles filling in the little gaps. So this is the Archimedes triangle. Was it convergent or divergent? So the main thing in this chapter is, can you show that a series is convergent or divergent, but you have to prove your case? You can't just guess 50-50, all right? You have to prove why it's one or the other, and you have to show all your work. So I'm going to show you exactly how to do that. Don't worry. So was this convergent or divergent? Okay, if you remember, when the little 
triangles got smaller and smaller and smaller, they eventually converged to a finite area under the parabola, a la Archimedes. It was convergent. Now just trust that for now. I'm going to kind of show you some background here. Let's say I went way out to a sub 101. What's a sub 101? The 101st term. How would you get it? Well, the first term is plug in one, it says. So the second term would be to plug in two. So the 101st term would be to plug in 101. And you would get one fourth to the 100th power. Okay. What kind of number is that? Isn't that tiny? Let's, let's work this out. 1 to the 100th is 1, but 4 to the 100th, we'll just call it 4 to the 100th. Big, big, big number. 1 over 4 to the 100th would be very, very tiny. That's a very small number. And then don't the numbers get so small eventually that they don't even really matter anymore, right? Kind of like the improper integration when we kept adding on the area and it got so small it didn't matter. Although for some curves, it escaped and went to infinity anyway. So that's part of the discussion. We're bringing that back. Okay, so we'll, we'll go through that too. So take the limit of what? Where are we trying to go? When I say the 101st term way down there, or when you see the infinity on top of the sigma way down there, where are we trying to go? Are we trying to go to infinity? Who's going to infinity? X, that was last chapter. Wait, isn't it in this chapter? Yeah, n is the number of terms. n is trying to get to infinity. That's a sub n, that's a sub 101. So you're gonna put n to infinity in approaching infinity in the blank, okay? The limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n, which would be the formula. What happens when you go to infinity? Well, what do we do with infinities? Plug it in, see if it works, right? Take infinity. Plug it in, infinity minus one is infinity. Uh-oh, wait a minute. One to the infinity is indeterminate. There's a way around that. Before you plug in the infinity, you're allowed to go ahead and take one to the n minus one and four to the n minus one in advance. I would recommend that. One to any power is itself. Infinity doesn't really count as a power because that's, that's not really a number, okay? So 1 to the n minus 1, believe it or not, is 1. 4 to the n minus 1 is simply 4 to the n minus 1. Rewrite it like this first. Now plug in infinity, and you get 1 over 4 to the infinity. And 1 over gigantic is essentially nothing. No wonder this thing converges. Because when you get way, way out there to the 101st term, it's practically nothing. And when you go to infinity, it converges to nothing. Okay? So the triangles are so small, they're worth practically nothing. All right? Now, let's go to the second one. Previous C. All right? Another wrapper named Previous C. Okay. So we've got this. Oh, wait a minute. I think we did this one before, too. We did C in another, another lesson. 11-1. Let's see. Let's, let's, let's remind ourselves. It says start at 1. Take 1, plug it in. 1 minus 1 is 0. 2 to the 0 is 1. 1 times 6 is 6. What does sigma say to do? Addition. Sigma says add all the infinite terms together and see if it converges, like this one, or if it diverges. What's the next integer? 2. Plug in 2. 2 minus 1 is 1. 2 to the first is 2 times 6 is 12. Oh, wait a minute. This is the very first one we did together. 6 plus 12 plus, you remember? 24 plus 48 plus dot, 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 forever. It was the doubling sequence that we turned into a series. All right, convergent or divergent? If you keep adding all those numbers bigger and bigger and bigger, that thing's going to diverge, clearly. Does everybody see the, um, we'll put a DIV. Does everybody see the base 2 is larger than 1, but then the base 1 fourth is less than 1? That's kind of a dead giveaway, as long as it's a positive n power. What's the 101st term? Well, take 101, plug it in there. 101 minus 1 is 100. Let's just leave it 6 times 2 to the 100th. I don't really care about what 2 to the 100th is right now. It's massive. Okay? That is a giant number. So when you go to infinity, the limit as n, the number of terms, approaches infinity because that's what all of our sigmas are going to do in this chapter. What happens when you apply that to this limit? Well, plug infinity in, okay? So, so what is a sub n? a sub n is the formula, so kind of get used to that in this chapter. a sub 1 is just that formula, 
if you plug in infinity, you get 6 times 2 to the infinity. Well, that's definitely infinity. All right, so you see what's happening here? When you have a divergent series, you see how those terms are blowing up big? And then when you have a convergent series, do you see how they're shrinking to practically nothing, right? So what's our conclusion? Well, the conclusion is going to be if you have a series and it's convergent, then what did we just get with the Archimedes triangle case? When we took the limit as n approaches infinity, didn't we get a zero in that blank up there? So this is going to be, let's say, equal to zero. However, if you have a series and it is divergent, and in this chapter you have to tell me, is it convergent or divergent, and what is your evidence? Then when you do the limit as n approaches infinity, what did we get up there in that blank with that other pattern, 6 plus 12 plus 24? It just blew up to infinity, right? Does this box have to be infinity to be divergent? No. It is simply not equal to zero, all right? If you have a divergent series, the limit as you approach infinity turns out to be anything but zero in a divergent series. It could be one. It could be 0 0.2. It could be 167. It could be infinity. If it's not zero, that is the result of a divergent series, okay? So that's the first important thing to really understand that's kind of new in this chapter, and we just did the research on it. Now, of course, I have to warn you. Let's say you did the limit first. Could you go backwards and say this is convergent? Well, that's a converse right there. Isn't that a converse? Is the converse usually true in math? Usually not, all right? So maybe you want to put this in your notes. Converse fails. As almost always in math, the converse fails. If you do the limit of some kind of pattern and you get zero, it does not necessarily mean that the series is convergent. But if you do have a convergent series, the limit will always be zero. So now that's interesting. And I, I can tell you what this kind of goes back to. If this helps, if it doesn't make sense quite yet, that's fine. But I'll tell you what it goes back to. Chapter nine. Remember improper integration? Do you remember when we did the area under 1 over x? See, this is the link here. This is the connection from chapter 9. The area under 1 over x was infinite, if you remember. It was divergent. Okay? But then we did the area under y equals 1 over x squared, and it was convergent. Okay? So, so here's a great counterexample right here. When you do the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over, let's say, n instead of x, right? 1 over n going to infinity just decreases down to zero. It just crumbles. This one also decreases down to zero. It just crumbles. But it, it really depends on how fast does it go towards that horizontal asymptote. Not fast enough to close the gap. Fast enough to make an infinitely long figure that had a finite area. That's what this is related to. So if that clicks for anybody right now, that's great. If it doesn't yet, don't worry. It will later. Okay, it'll be very, very obvious later on in this chapter. Okay, so that's why the converse fails. Just because the limit is zero does not mean you have a convergent series. It may be divergent, like the 1 over x case. Great counterexample. Okay, now let me give you some good news about this one, though. This one is a rare place in mathematics where the converse is also true. And you are going to use this. This is going to be one of your favorite rules in this chapter, actually. Calculus students love this one because it's probably the easiest rule in the whole chapter. If you take the limit of a series of the pattern, like this we're about to do, and it is not zero, then you can prove that it is definitely divergent. Matter of fact, you can just state that right there by showing the limit, okay? So it works backwards also. But if the limit is zero, not enough information. You don't quite know, okay? So let's go to our very first example and let's see what we're gonna be doing in this chapter, trying to prove that things are convergent or divergent, showing your work. Okay, first of all, just to kind of see this play out, let's see what this looks like, just for fun today. You wouldn't have to do this on a test, but let's take two and plug it in, and you would get two over natural log of two. That would be your first term. Sigma means plus, according to Leonard Euler. Take the next integer, three, and plug that in. You would get three over natural log of three. You get a nice little pattern here. Plus four over natural log of four, plus dot, 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 goes to infinity. Goes forever. The question is, does this converge or diverge? If you keep adding these little fractions together, and they get smaller and smaller and smaller. 
Should you? And by the way, yeah, the, the, the top is building, so maybe they're also getting bigger, right? Do you end up getting a number, a finite number that this converges to, just like some of that crazy infinite space converged to a finite area? Do you get a finite number? Or does it just blow up bigger and you get infinity, which is called divergent? That's the question right there, okay? Now, completely for fun, I just want to show you something. A sub 1 trillion, just for fun. You could easily plug this into a calculator, by the way. I wanted to figure out what the 1 trillionth term is, just to show math students what, how to be thinking about this. If you go to the 1 trillionth term and you plug the integer 1 trillion in, on the top you would get 1 trillion. That's a huge number. On the bottom, you would get the natural log of 1 trillion. You can put that into any calculator. The natural log of 1 trillion is approximately 27.6. Didn't I tell you many times that the natural log curve rises but then really gets level and it very slowly progresses? If you go right 1 trillion on the x-axis, the y-coordinate is only 27.6. We haven't made very much progress. Hey, eventually in outer space it'll reach the top of my board in the classroom, right? Okay. You know, that's not proof, but it is a good idea. This thing looks like it's going to diverge. By the time you get out there to the one trillionth term, the, the, the terms that you're adding onto these are massive. That's a giant number. And wouldn't we all agree that n is growing faster than the natural log of n? So these, these fractions are getting larger, okay? So that's a good thing to think about. The weird thing in this chapter is that things are not always what they appear. Even when you look at the trillionth term and you say, my goodness, we're adding on such large amounts onto what we've already added. This has to diverge, Mr. Wade. The answers can absolutely shock you. So it's good to look at this and understand what we're doing, but it's also good not to ever assume in this chapter. Now, my job as a calculus teacher in chapter 11 is to give you all the tools, all the superhero powers, so that you can assess these bizarre and crazy different series. I'll give you a tool so you can solve some of them. Then I'll give you a harder series where that tool no longer works, and I'll give you another superpower. And then I'll give you another series where those superpowers no longer work. It's an even tougher battle. But then I'll give you a new power so you can solve those, and we'll just kind of build through them together, okay? That's all we have to do. So, if I were you as a BC Calculus student or as a Calc 2 student out here who's watching this, this is what I would do first for all of these series. The easiest thing to start with is to simply take the limit as n approaches infinity. Start with that, see if that gives you any information. If that solves the case, great. If it doesn't work, we'll move on to future superhero powers, right? So limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n, which is n over natural log of n. That's the best place to start right there and just see what the limit is. Beware though. We are actually doing the converse right now of our conclusion. This is a correct conclusion up here. This is true, and this is true, or I wouldn't have written it on the paper, right? But the converse, remember, the converse of this one works. It's rare. The converse of this one fails, okay? We're doing the limit first, and then we're going to go backwards and say, is it convergent or divergent? See why it's a converse? So, try the limit, then we'll discuss. If you go to infinity... All right, where are our rules about infinite limits? Oh, no wonder you grilled us on infinite limits, Mr. Wade, because now they're going to be put into practice. Everything in this chapter is infinity. By the way, everything in this chapter is positive infinity, never negative infinity, okay? So we're only using positive infinity. All right, how do you do that limit? Number one, can you even graph it? Now, remember, this supersedes the three gems that I gave you, okay? Number one, can you graph n over natural log of n? Who knows what that looks like? x over natural log of x? I don't know. Don't graph it. You can't graph it easily. Let's go to the three gems now from chapter 10 that we mentioned. All right. Uh, or even, even that was even back in chapter 9, I think, right? Okay. Three gems. You know what? Now that I think about it, that actually could have been back in chapter 8. It was a long time ago, but we keep referring to it. Number one. Can you just plug in infinity? Well, if you plug in infinity to the top, you get infinity. If you plug in infinity to the bottom, the natural log of infinity is eventually infinity. Oh, we got indeterminate. Well, that didn't work. Okay. Level two, weaker, stronger game only for positive infinity, which it will be in this chapter. Or 
Now that we've done chapter 10 called L'Hopital's Rule, infinity over infinity is L'Hopital's Rule fair game. So you kind of add that with your gem number two. L'Hopital's Rule or weaker, stronger game, whichever one you prefer, they both work. Okay? Uh, and let, me, let me show you both. If you want to do L'Hopital's Rule, you would take the derivative of the top, which is 1. You would take the derivative of the bottom, which is 1 over n. You would keep change flip, and you would do the limit as n approaches infinity of n over 1, which is n. Now plug in infinity, and you get infinity. Or the weaker, stronger game, if you have a polynomial over a polynomial, natural logs, logarithms are not polynomials, or if you have a single term over a single term, which natural log is, and you have a positive infinity, the weaker, stronger game says whoever's weaker crumbles and becomes zero. Natural log of n is a weaker rising graph than n. It's the weakest rising graph. So that turns into the weak one turns into zero, and anything divided by zero does not exist. Okay? In other words, you don't get a limit. We'll look down there. You get a limit of infinity. Yeah, that's not a limit, really. That's not a boundary. No wonder it does not exist. Okay? So either way, was the limit zero or was it not zero? Infinity is not zero. Or if you did a weaker, stronger game, undefined is not zero. And this converse does work. If the infinite limit is not zero, there's no way that thing's going to converge. That series is definitely divergent. Okay? Because what does that mean? What does it mean when you get to bigger and bigger terms and you're not getting zero? Okay? That means that the terms aren't shrinking sufficiently small enough to be meaningless. There's something that's more than zero. You're still adding on another piece and another piece and another piece and another piece. So that's what's happening here. Okay? Definitely divergent. All right, so it works backwards. That's great news. That's the easiest rule I can teach you in this chapter. And again, students love it because it's very, very simple. Abracadabra. So for letter B, we have the infinite series from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n. Now, what does that really mean? Okay, let's go through what that means. Take 1, plug it in. 1 over 1 is 1. Plus, take the next integer 2, plug it in. That's 1 half. Plus, take the next integer 3, plug that in. That's 1 over 3 plus 1 over 4, plus dot, 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 goes forever, just for fun. The trillionth term, a sub 1 trillion, would equal, okay, the top would be 1, over the bottom would be 1 trillion, right? Now, wait a minute, 1 over 1 trillion, isn't that practically nothing? In, in limit world, it is 0, it's exactly 0 when you go to infinity. So, wait a minute. If you're adding 1 plus 1 half plus 1 third plus 1 fourth and you're eventually adding on pieces that are that small, surely this thing's going to converge, right? When you keep adding on those pieces, it must be convergent. Think again. You, you can't assume in this chapter, all right? By the way, if anybody's thinking ahead, 1 over n is identical to 1 over x, and we were just talking about the area under 1 over x. So what in the world is happening here? Okay. So the, the, the terms way down there are tiny. Let's go ahead and take the limit as n approaches infinity of our formula 1 over n. Well, step number one, can you graph it? Actually, 1 over x you could graph pretty easily. It's a hyperbola, right? 1 over x, graph it like that. It's a hyperbola, and when you approach infinity, it's settling into the asymptote 0. Or you could just do a simple plug-in, take infinity, plug it in, 1 over infinity is... Zero also, okay? Now, didn't we get our conclusion number one? But wait, we're doing the converse, which fails and doesn't work. If you have a convergent series, yes, those will always have a zero as your infinite limit. But just because the infinite limit gives you zero does not mean you can go backwards and assume convergence. And as a matter of fact, this could be convergent or divergent, we don't know. So our little test here, if you get zero, it's actually inconclusive. You can write inconclusive, you can write not enough information. Okay? We don't know. So if you get zero, 
that actually could end up being divergent. By the way, we will learn in this chapter that this is actually divergent. Wow, wait a minute. Okay, well, just wait on that one. I'll show you later because some of you have been wondering since chapter 9 why this diverges and does not converge. Well, I'll show you. I'll prove it to you. So, not enough information. If it's not zero, you can conclude divergent. If it is zero, who knows? And like in this case, it would have been misleading. Okay? By the way, just for fun, this thing right here, it's very classic. It's called the harmonic series. All right? Boy, does this have some real-life implications. The harmonic series, very famous series right here. And if anybody's thinking, well, you should be thinking this in an art school. If anybody's thinking root word of harmonic is harmony, and also you learn about harmonics, if you're an instrumentalist, if you're a vocalist, guess what? Yes, absolutely related. This series is actually related to many things. For instance, the way that a violin string vibrates and then eventually settles down. How about that? So this is actually music related, all right? Music related. Matter of fact, my father was a world expert, the number one world expert in translating music to math and math to music. And so he studied the harmonic series and made connections to the violin, the cello, various instruments that no mathematician had ever made before. Very interesting. By the way, the first human beings to ever prove that this series is actually divergent, even though a lot of people thought certainly it's convergent, they proved it was divergent in the 1600s. Guess who? Both Bernoulli brothers, both Jacob and Johann. So the two Bernoulli brothers got together and really worked on this one, and they proved to human beings that, nope, that one's divergent. Wait, because it's coming in another lesson, and so we'll really get into it. So today... You do a limit, it's zero, you might want to say convergent, not necessarily, okay? If you don't get zero, awesome, divergent. So that is your first attack in this chapter to try to solve a problem. So, nothing to write here, just want to go through it quickly with you. I will give you eight superpowers in this chapter. This is test number one of eight. This is simply called the divergence test, that's the name of it. Some people call it the nth term test. I don't prefer that, but you're basically assessing the nth term way down the line to see what happens to it, okay? So conclusion, if the limit is not zero, you can say that it is divergent. The series is divergent, and if the limit is zero, then it is inconclusive, and you simply let n go to infinity, all right? And that is test number one, and that is where you will always start all of these problems. And before we get into letter C, you know, of course, I'm going to tell you the discoverer of each one of these tests. I always have to give the historical credit, right? So the divergence test, that one was known back in the BC era, and they're not quite sure who was the first one to come up with it, okay? So, I don't know, probably uh, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, one of the philosophers, or Archimedes, or Euclid, probably one of those, okay? Could have been some unknown, who knows? So we don't know, no credit there. We'll, we'll get to other ones, though. All right, so then they give you one of these, or Mr. Wade gives you one of these. And I say, let n start at zero, and we're gonna start counting up. Oh, and the last problem, by the way, I said start at n equals 2. Did you notice I didn't start at n equals 1, like they always do in Algebra 2 and classes like that? The reason I didn't start at 1 is because natural log of n was on the bottom. If I had started at 1, the very first term would have been natural log of 1 on the bottom, but natural log of 1 is 0 on the bottom. The first term would have been does not exist, and then no matter how much you added on to that, it would have been does not exist. That would have been a disaster. Okay, so... Let's do the infinite series from 0 to infinity of this one. All right? Well, let's just plug in some numbers just to see what happens, just out of curiosity. 0 squared is 0 over 0 plus 0 plus 577. So the first term is going to be 0. All right? Plus. And then you take 1 and plug that in for all the n's. And I ended up getting 1 squared is 1 divided by the number that is 877. Interesting. Okay? Then just for fun, I plugged in 2. And when I plugged in 2, I got 2 squared was 4. And then when I plugged 2 into the bottom, I got 1,377. I like how that ends with 77 every time. Plus dot, dot, dot. And that keeps going. Now, just for fun, I went out and did the 50th term just to kind of show math students what's going on here. Okay? When you get to the 50th term, at which point you've gotten pretty deep into the series, right? Okay. On the top, 50 squared is 2,500, of course. 25 double the zeros. I've taught you that trick before. All right. When I plugged it into the bottom, I got 260,577. There's that 77 again. 
that decimal, if you make it as a decimal, when you divide those two numbers together, you get roughly 0 0.1. My goodness, those fractions, those numbers are getting very, very, very small, aren't they? That's getting so small, it hardly matters anymore. I bet when you get to the one trillionth term, you're going to be hardly adding anything, practically zero at that point. Oh, we talked about this already, though. If those numbers are blowing up big, yeah, you can trust it's divergent. But if the numbers are getting small, who cares? Big deal. That really doesn't tell you much because we've seen before that maybe it is divergent even though the numbers are getting small. So you can't quite trust it. So here's what we do. First attempt, first superpower. Let the limit of n going to infinity get applied to that. So the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n, if you want to save writing all that stuff out of there, that's fine. That's acceptable. Okay, let's try the infinite limit. Take infinity. Oh, first of all, can you graph that? No, so don't even try to graph it because that's the easiest way out. So gem number one, take infinity, plug it in. You get infinity over infinity. Oops, that doesn't tell you anything. But it does lead to step number two, the weaker, stronger game or L'Hopital's rule. L'Hopital's rule, it'll take you double L'Hopital actually because the first series is going to give you like 2n and 200n right off the bat. You're still going to have infinity over infinity. So you have to do two levels of L'Hopital or probably this time the weaker, stronger game is better. L'Hopital's was better in the last example. So I would probably just go to this. Weaker, stronger, it's a tie n squared over n squared is a tie. And remember on that old test when it was a tie, you took the coefficients of the highest power of x or n. And so the limit is 1 over 100. In the tie case, you just take the coefficients. Okay? So when you go to infinity, this thing seems to be converging to the number 1 one hundredth. But does that mean that the series, the sum, is converging? See, the term, the individual term, is converging to a finite number. But for the whole series to converge to a certain outcome when you add all those results together, remember our divergence test, number one of eight. This number is not zero. If it is zero, it's inconclusive. If it is not zero, it proves divergence. What? Are you kidding me? But those numbers were getting so small. We looked at the 50th term. It was so tiny. 0.1. Well, turns out that you get just enough little pieces of area to keep adding on to it that you will get infinite area and not a convergent number in the end. Okay? Trust the math. Don't, don't, don't trust some of your instincts. Trust the math. All right? So divergent.